It's the Pain Exam Podcast with your host, David Rosenblum, MD. If you treat pain or have an interest in pain management, join us as we discuss painful disorders, alternative treatments, practice management, and more. Be sure to subscribe to the Pain Exam newsletter at painexam.com and review the podcast on Stitcher or iTunes. Our high-yield premium episodes are now available on the Pain Exam app with a premium subscription or access for free with a CME subscription at painexam.com. And now, without further ado, here's your host, Dr. Rosenblum. Welcome back. I have a busy summer planned. Uh, I'm going to be teaching ultrasound at Aspen as well as in New York and then San Juan. Hope to see you guys there while I'm also revising the NREP website. NREP, by the way, stands for Neuromodulation Regional Anesthesia and Pain. It's meant to encompass any aspect of pain management as well as anesthesia and PM&R. We have board prep as well as workshops, courses, etc. And I am just... Um, getting close to finishing the online regenerative medicine course for CME credits. So if you guys are interested in learning about regenerative medicine for pain, we use evidence-based material. Um, I'm referring a lot to ASIP's guidelines as well as many well-known publications in the talks. And you'll learn about how, when, and why you may use biologics for pain in the spine, the techniques, We have a spine course as well as lectures on other biologic products and um, also what you may not want to use just yet because there's still a lot of regulations around that stuff. And, of course, the live regenerative medicine course coming up in November. Hope to see you guys there. If you're interested in learning more, go to nrappain.org where we feature this regenerative medicine course. Or you could just check out painexam.com where we feature the pain exam complete. And today, I'm actually going to be talking about phenol because I'm dealing with a patient, really nice lady, who has uh, neuralgia peristetica, and I'm toying with the idea of using phenol. And the reason is this woman's been through um, over 10 years of suffering. She's had radiofrequency ablation by other pain physicians. She's had surgical decompression of the lower femoral cutaneous nerve. She had a peripheral nerve stimulator device in which gave some relief for two months and then uh, was referred to me for a permanent implant, which I did, and everything went smooth. It was pretty easy to find her nerve. However, um, there is an issue with the adhesive for the battery for the external peripheral nerve stimulator, so I'm asking her to work with the company on that while I still try to troubleshoot, and I've tried other procedures, ablations on her, and I'm at the point where I'm thinking of doing a chemical ablation. And phenol um, is something I'm looking into. I don't have as much experience with phenol as I do with alcohol. And um, we call this neurolysis, which it is, but, you know, there is a return of 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 the sensation. There is some healing that occurs, so it may not be completely permanent, in fact, one of my colleagues refers to phenol as a local anesthetic, which it's not, but he thinks it should be classified as that because it's not a permanent block, according to him. And um, so I decided to do some research on my own to find out more. So here's the podcast lecture. Um, I hope you find it useful. By the way, these lectures are being added to the NRAP Pain website and um, the Virtual Pain Fellowship, which is located there. So go check it out. So today I'm going to discuss phenol. We learned a lot about this in studying for the boards, alcohol versus phenol. I'm not really going to focus on that. I'm really going to dissect phenol out as it's a drug I actually have not had much experience with personal use as my hospital was never able able to obtain it. And I used alcohol for my neurolytic blocks, mainly done for cancer patients when they were as inpatients. And I just wanted to go into this review article I found by Dr. D'Souza and Dr. Warner, and the the references will be in the show notes. So phenol was not really used as a neurolytic agent until 1926. It was described by Doppler in a paper, uh, followed by the description of intrathecal injection in 1955. In 1959, Nathan and Kelly described the earliest use of phenol for spasticity. 
and reported relief following intrathecal injections. Phenol is a chemical composite agent comprised of a carb- carbolic acid, phenic acid, phenolic acid, phenyl hydroxide, hydroxybenzene, oxybenzone. It denatures proteins readily and may cause denervation when injected near neural structures, leading to loss of cellular fatty content, separation of the myelin sheath from the axon, and axonal edema. So the activity in this paper reviews the role of phenol to denervate nerves, indications, contraindications, and the role of the drug in pain management. Neurolysis is temporary denervation of a targeted nerve or nerve plexus by directed infiltration of chemicals, obliteration from cryo or thermal ablation, cryotherapy or thermal ablation. Uh, Back in 1863, they described the first chemical neurolysis for the treatment of pain, in which irritant chemicals were subcutaneously injected into painful body areas to benefit those with sciatic neuralgia. It wasn't until 1926 that use of phenol as a neurolytic agent um, was was started to occur, and um, the indications um, for the nerve block with phenol, you know, you need to look at the risk-benefits of turners. Of course, many patients are palliative, so the benefit of pain relief may outweigh the other risks. Many patients have failed other therapies, such as um, psychological counseling, physical therapy, pharmacotherapy, and diagnostic nerve blocks should be employed prior to performing a neurolysis. Targets for the chemical neurolysis may include peripheral nerves, saddle block, lumbar sympathetic block, celiac plexus block, and the neuroaxial blocks. And the indications um, for neurolysis may be broadly applicable to various neurolytic agents. Phenol is widely instilled agent to treat severe spasticity as direct inner injection near a motor nerve can selectively reduce hypertonicity. Intrathecal phenol has also been utilized to treat spasticity of the spinal cord and intractable pain disorders such as end-stage cancer of the abdomen or pelvis. Phenol infiltration along the paravertebral and perivascular sympathetic fibers can establish a sympathectomy for treatment of peripheral vascular disease, and you need to differentiate the neuroblastic block for pain relief versus the spasticity. Um, in which motor or mixed nerves are targeted preferentially in the management of spastic disorders. Contraindications include patient refusal, active infection, tumor involvement at the needle entry site for non-malignant or spastic disorders, and bleeding disorder or use of anticoagulant therapies when injections will occur at high-risk sites such as the neuraxis. Phenol is available in an 89% solution, must be prepared by a hospital pharmacy. It is unstable at room temperature and oxidizes in the presence of air and light, changing to red. Depending on the desired pharmacokinetic and therapeutic effect, phenol may be prepared in aqueous glycerin or lipid solution and diluted to the desired concentration, typically 2-3%. to Phenol mixed with glycerin causes phenol to diffuse slowly, resulting in very limited spread pattern at the site of injection. The viscous preparation of phenol diluted with glycerin is hyperbaric in relation to cerebrospinal fluid. Aqueous preparations of phenol are more potent neurolytic agents with a wider spread. Contrast may also be mixed to aid in visualization during fluoroscopy. Although the ideal concentration for neurolysis is not really studied, the ideal ranges from 3% to 12%. Dilute concentrations less than 5% result in protein denaturation of axons and blood vessels, while concentrations greater than 5% may produce protein coagulation and non-selective segmental demyelination. The maximum daily dose is 1 gram, and caution must be taken in patients with advanced liver disease as the liver metabolizes phenol. Of course, use sterile technique when performing the injections. If nerve stimulation approach is preferred, advancement of the needle and current reductions are continued until desired motor response is achieved. Of course, ultrasound may make this a little bit more accurate and um, eliminate the need for this. Complications with phenol. 
Accidental intravascular injection could cause tinnitus and flushing. Neuritis may manifest after partial destruction of somatic nerves with subsequent re- regeneration. Dysesthesias, hypesthesias may be worse than the original pain. There can be prolonged motor paralysis from motor nerves denervation or vascular injury as well as bowel or bladder dysfunction and sexual dysfunction. Phenol is metabolized in the liver via conjugation, ox- oxidation, and excreted by the kidneys. Typically, it's avoided in patients with advanced Hepatic disease, chronic exposure to phenol may lead to renal toxicity, skin lesions, gastrointestinal effects. Systemic effects include nausea, vomiting, CNS stimulation, cardiovascular depression. Due to the side effect profile, recommendations avoidance of phenol for celiac plexus block and sparing use for splanchnic block due to the proximity of major blood vessels has been advocated. Side effects are uncommon if the systemic dose is less than 100 milligrams. Neuroaxial administration of phenol has fallen out of favor due to potential <laughs> side effects, and the um, it's mostly used in the end-stage cancer population. Neuroaxial neurolysis may provide improvement in pain symptoms and quality of life in patients with cancer in the abdomen or pelvis, although the modality will often lead to loss of bowel or bladder function and lower extremity weakness. Only a small percentage of cancer patients are suitable for this type of neurolytic block, and it is a last resort. In terms of pain control, phenol neuroablation is widely known in chronic pain. Uh, Wesker explored the benefits in 42 patients with refractory chronic non-malignant pain. The interventions for phenol neurolysis in the study were diverse, comprising of lumbar sympathectomy, medial branch destruction, SI joint injections, intercostal neurolysis, greater occipital nerve destruction, general femoral neuroablation, and paracoxygeal infiltration. The use of 4% phenol in aqueous solution was effective and safe for neurolysis in these patients. No complications reported. However, due to the risk of flaccid paralysis, phenol use should still be reserved for selective cases of non-malignant pain far removed from motor nerves and the spinal cord. In terms of the adverse effects of neurolytic agents, alcohol and phenol. Phenol is more potent than alcohol. 5% phenol is about equal, equal to 40% alcohol in terms of its potency with, neurolysis, with respect to neurolysis. Most providers agree that phenol leads to a shorter duration and less, less intense neurolytic block with more systemic effects compared to alcohol. Some studies report no difference. In a randomized controlled pilot study on 20 patients with hemiplegic stroke, it was observed that both phenol and alcohol were equally effective in reducing spasticity, though the use of a 50% alcohol in management of ankle plantar flexor spasticity appears to be longer lasting. Non-randomized trial 57 cancer patients showed a greater incidence of systemic side effects with phenol compared to alcohol, including nausea, hypotension, and bradycardia. Phenol is a well-recognized neurologic agent and may serve other useful um, indications. Uh, there is talk of using phenol for prolotherapy at lower concentrations. But I would advise caution with that because of all the neurolytic concerns and systemic concerns as mentioned above. So there you go, phenol for neurolysis. I hope it is um, something that you use cautiously, but it can be a valuable tool in our arsenal. And before I wrap it up, I just wanted to mention an article uh, here referring to chemical ablation of genicular nerve with phenol for pain relief in patients with neosteoarthritis, a prospective study performed uh, by Dr. Rizzo, Dr. Ferraro, Dr. Frederico, Dr. Peng, and Dr. Luzo. And uh, this was done in December 2020, and basically... um, they described um, 43 patients with neosteoarthritis, pain intensity, numeric rating scale over four, duration of pain over six months. And they performed ultrasound guided genicular blocks with 1.5 mLs of quarter percent bupivacaine at each site. Those who reported more than 50% reduction in NRS went on to undergo chemical neurolysis using 1.5 milliliter 7% glycerated phenol in each nerve. Uh, the NRS and Western Ontario and McMaster's University Arthritis Index, otherwise known as WOMAC scores, were assessed before intervention and at two weeks 
one, two, three, and six months following the intervention. The NRS and Womax scores improved in all time points. Mean pain intensity improved from 7.2 to um, to uh, 4.2 at six months. Composite Womax scores improved from 48.7 to about 20.7. And adverse offense events did not persist beyond one month, which included local pain, hypoesthesia, swelling, and bruises. So they conclude that chemical neuralysis of genicular nerves with phenol provided efficacious analgesia and functional improvement for at least six months in most patients with a low incidence of side effects. So it's just something, uh, you know, to consider something else in your arsenal. Perhaps um, you're convinced that the patient needs... Um, to have the nerve ablated or you did the ablation and it didn't work and the patients are still um, suffering from severe pain, you may want to consider performing the ablation uh, with phenol. I wouldn't say this is standard practice, but at the same time, um, some of these patients are desperate. They've had their knee replaced and they're miserable or they cannot have their knee replaced or are refusing a knee replacement. And the thermal or cryoablation either did not work or is perhaps not an option for them for various um, factors such as coverage, etc. Um, anyway, thanks for listening and good luck. Dr. Rosenblum is here solely to educate and you are solely responsible for all your decisions and actions in response to any information contained herein. These podcasts are not intended as a substitute for the medical advice of a physician to a particular patient or specific ailment. You should regularly consult a physician in matters relating to yours or another's health. You understand that this podcast is not intended as a substitute for consultation with a licensed medical professional. Copyright 2017, David Rosenblum, all rights reserved. No part of this publication may be reproduced produced, stored in a retrieval system, or transmitted in any form or by any means, electronic, mechanical, recording, or otherwise, without the prior written permission of the author.